We're going to continue on with our talk about biodiversity today. So do you guys remember what biodiversity is? We said that it was diversity in living things. So having a variety of different organisms or species in a particular area. Now we talked about three different types of biodiversity. What were those three types of biodiversity we talked about? We talked about ecosystem diversity, meaning are there a lot of different habitats? Are there ponds, lakes, rivers, grasslands, deserts? That would be ecosystem diversity. We also talked about species diversity. Are there lots of different species? And we talked about genetic diversity. Are there lots of different genes in a population? So we're going to continue on talking about biodiversity. We're going to talk about um, different places around the earth that have a lot of biodiversity, and then we're going to talk about how to calculate it. So the first thing that we're going to take notes on is ecosystems that have a lot of biodiversity. The first ecosystem, like you guys saw in the lab, are tropical rainforests. Now here's what I want you to write. I just want you to write the bolded information, the bold and underline. Don't worry about writing this fact. Okay, you just need to know that tropical rainforests have a lot of biodiversity. So tropical rainforests cover 7% of the Earth's surface, which is not very much, but they have over half of the world's species. So even though they only make up a tiny part of our planet, they have a ton of species. The other ecosystem with a lot of biodiversity is coral reefs. And as far as aquatic habitats go, these contain the most biodiversity out of any kind of aquatic habitat, out of ponds, lakes, deep oceans, shallow oceans, rivers, streams, all of those. Coral reefs have the most. So these are the two ecosystems with the most amount of biodiversity. Now, the opposite of biodiversity is called monoculture. What does mono mean? Mono means one, okay? So monoculture means one plant or one crop is being grown. We love to do this in the United States because we plant whole fields of soybeans, of corn, um, of just one type of crop. And as you guys saw with the tree demo, this allows disease to spread really quickly. So imagine if you're a corn farmer and you're growing a whole field of corn, well, all of a sudden, let's say that there is some kind of disease that comes through and it hits all of your corn plants. Well, when that disease comes through and kills all your corn plants, you're not going to be able to make very much money off of your corn anymore because it's all going to be dead. Whereas, for example, if you had planted corn and soybeans, all right, maybe the soybeans wouldn't be affected and only the corn would have died. So you could still go and plant or sell soybeans at the market. So biodiversity is super important because it prevents diseases from spreading really quickly, all right? Um, the other thing is that monoculture, typically when we only have one variety of a plant being planted, like corn, is typically all of the same type of corn. It has all the same genes. It's genetically identical. So when we talk about biodiversity and needing genetic diversity, this is something we don't see a lot when we have monoculture. So now we're gonna look at how do we measure biodiversity? So how do scientists know that rainforests are the most biodiverse places on the planet? How do they know that deserts don't really have a lot of biodiversity? How do they calculate it? So you guys calculated it a little bit in that lab, but we're gonna talk about what um, scientists use in order to look at biodiversity. So there's two different things they look at. The first is richness, species richness, okay? If you're rich, you have a lot of money, right? If you're rich with species, you have a lot of different species. So species richness refers to the number of species in an area. So for example, if I have a snake, if I have a caterpillar and I have a mouse, okay, um, in an area, that would be three species, right? So the species richness would be three. Now, if you look at this map, 
this map shows you the species richness. So it shows you on a scale of one to 197, how rich or species rich each part of the world is. So notice we're here up in the United States, okay? Blue means less species rich, red means more, more species rich. So notice where are all of the species or the most amount of species, they're right around the equator for the most part, okay? We don't have a lot of species up north or down south. So species richness is greatest near the equator. And we talked about that with tropical rainforests. A lot of tropical rainforests are found near the equator. Now notice up here in Africa, we don't have a lot of species uh, richness. Anyone know what's up there in Northern Africa? That's the Sahara Desert. So the desert does not have a whole ton of species compared to other ecosystems. Now, here is my uh, picture. We're also gonna talk about another thing that scientists look at, okay? So first of all, they can count the number of species. That's species richness. So for example, if we count the number of species, these are gonna be two different habitats. Here's the first habitat and the second habitat. So if we count the different species, we've got a whale, eagle, and a kangaroo. So we have three different species on the left. On the right, we have a whale, an eagle, and a kangaroo. So we have three species on the right. So these both have the same species richness. Now, scientists say though, that both of these would not have the same amount of biodiversity because we also have to look at something called species evenness. Species evenness refers to how many of each kind of species we have. Notice over here, we only have one eagle, one whale, and a million kangaroos, okay? Whereas on the right, we have about equal numbers. We've got two kangaroos, two eagles, and two whales. So scientists would argue that the ecosystem on the right here is more biodiverse because it's got more equal numbers of the species in it. So species evenness is how close the numbers the species are in an environment to each other. So do we have roughly, you know, several hundred of this species, several hundred of this species, several hundred of this species? Or is it really lopsided? Do we have a thousand of one species and only a couple of another? These stars kind of represent that idea. This box would be more, would have greater species evenness, okay? So if we say that these different color stars are different species, this one's more even because we have four of each kind. Whereas on the right here, this is not as even because we have a whole ton of red stars and not very many of the other colors. So, in addition to species richness, we also look at species evenness. How close in number are the species in a particular environment? How close are they to each other, okay? Now, why is biodiversity important? Well, the more biodiverse the community is, the more stable it will be. So don't write this down. We're gonna talk about it on the next page. So stability. Okay, think about what it means to be stable. A stable community is one that can maintain kind of the same conditions. If there's a disturbance, it's not like the whole ecosystem is going to collapse and everything's going to die. After a disturbance, a stable community will be able to bounce back. So let's say that there is a uh, fire in a prairie or in a forest and it burns down half of that forest. Well, what's gonna to happen to the other half of that forest? If it's a really stable ecosystem, the other half of the forest will just carry on and the forest that was burned down will regrow. If it's not very stable and there's not a lot of different species, the other half of the forest might end up kind of collapsing. Some of the food chains might be really affected. We might get some species dying out. So an ecosystem is stable when it's able to maintain constant conditions, even though there might be disturbances. Which brings me to my next point. What is a disturbance then? A disturbance is anything that could change a community or ecosystem. It could be a fire. 
They could be introducing a new predator. It could be a disease. It could be hunters. It could be building a shopping mall. So a disturbance is anything that could change an ecosystem. And again, the more biodiversity we have, the easier that ecosystem or community is going to be able to bounce back from that disturbance and carry on. All right, last slide here. So what are some characteristics then of stable communities? Well, the first thing we said is that they have lots of species or lots of biodiversity, and that allows them to maintain these stable conditions because if one part of the food web disappears, there's lots of other species that can fill in that part of the food web. So lots of different species, biodiversity. In addition, stable communities also have really big populations. So it's not like they just have one uh, tree frog or one lion, okay? They have lots of lions and lots of tree frogs and whatever other animals that they're going to have in their populations. Remember, when we talked about evolution, we said large populations are more likely to survive, okay? They've got lots of different genes. They're at less of a risk of becoming endangered or extinct. So large populations are really important. That's one of the reasons when scientists talk about evenness, they want to talk about, you know, how even are those populations? Because if we only have one or two of a species, chances are it might die out really quickly. And large populations have a lot of genetic diversity, a lot of different genes. And that's really important as well because when there are a lot of different genes, we get better chance that one of those organisms or some of those organisms will survive if there's a disturbance because they might have a gene that will help them survive. So these are all the characteristics of stable communities. Okay? Stable doesn't mean they never change. Communities change. It just means that they're not changing drastically all at once and dying out and causing lots of species to go extinct, it means they're able to bounce back from a disturbance, okay? So today we talked about uh, ecosystems with the most biodiversity. We said tropical rainforests and coral reefs have a lot of biodiversity. We also talked about how to measure biodiversity with species richness and evenness. And then we talked about communities and stability. So what I'm gonna have you guys do is a lab with beans, so bean lab, dried beans, like pinto beans, black beans. And here's what you're gonna do. You're gonna get a paper lunch bag, okay? Now, your paper lunch bag is either gonna say A or B on it. It doesn't matter which one you get because you gotta do both of them anyway. So real scientists, when they go out to measure biodiversity, Diversity, they don't get these pretty little pictures with stars that represent animals. They can't just go out if I give you a huge forest and be like, count all the animals, okay? Real scientists have to capture animals or take samples of different uh, plants and animals because they can't count all of them. So what you guys are going to be doing is pretending you're going to capture some of the animals in an ecosystem. So this plat or paper bag is your ecosystem. It's your forest. And you're going to go hunt for some uh, animals. So when you get your bag, I need you to not look inside of it. I will let you look inside of it later, okay? If you want to stick your hands in it, go for it and feel it. I promise you there are beans in there. Nothing is going to eat you or bite you or hurt you, okay? So what you're going to be doing is you're going to be picking one bean at a time Okay, capturing one animal at a time, taking it out and looking at what that animal is. Okay, so in this case, we're looking what color is it? Is it white? Is it black? And you're going to record that on the table. Okay, so you're going to capture your animals. Now, I'm going to let you at the end, you're going to have to actually dump out the beans and look at all of the organisms in your population. So I'm going to let you do that. Real scientists wouldn't get to do that normally, but I'm going to let you do that, okay? But for the first part, you're just picking out one bean at a time, recording what it is in the table, and then you're going to look at species richness, which bag had more species, and species evenness, which bag was more even.